WOL Washington, WPRS HD2 Waldorf, WKYS HD2 Washington, WMMJ HD2 Bethesda, a Radio 1 station, and worldwide at WOLDCnews.com. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL, Radio 1 Incorporated, or their management. All right, it's another great day, and we're ready to discuss subjects that will make a difference in your day. This is a place that people connect, ideas are shared, and lives are enriched. My name is Stacy Young. My author's name is S.L. Young, but please call me Sly, and welcome to the debut of Beyond Just Talk with S.L. Young. But before we get started today, I'm going to let you know that we're not going to have any guests in studio today because I want to have an opportunity to introduce myself to my audience and the things that I want to do with this show. But I do want to tell you, give you a little bit of a tease for uh, next week. Next week, I have an incredible first guest scheduled. This individual is a name that most might not instantaneously recognize. He's negotiated many of the deals behind one of the biggest bankable names in Hollywood. And he's also an executive producer on a number of shows, including one that recently won a Daytime Emmy. So I'm really looking forward and excited to have this gentleman that's going to be on our show next week. But for this week, let's start off by giving you an idea of what we're going to do today. So I'm going to kick off this new program. I'm going to introduce myself and the reasons that I want to do the show. And then also tell you about some of the highly unlikely events that got me here. Because being uh, a journalist in terms of blogging and writing on Huffington Post wasn't something that I intended to do, nor did I ever have any dreams or aspirations of being on the radio. And yet, here I am today. So I want to share part of my journey with you, um, because I think it's important to let you know where I've come from to get here. And what are some of my plans for the show? And then we're also going to talk about the importance of having a team. And I'm going to give a little thanks to some of my supporters that have helped me to get here because none of us do do any of the things that we do alone. And then we're also going to talk about some of my upcoming guests. So let's start with some quotes that helped me on my journey. So some of the quotes that helped me initially were re- redefining myself through self-talks. And I didn't even realize it that in November of 2011, I really didn't like the direction of my life. But for some reason, I wrote a self-talk. It was just a conversation that I was having with myself. And I was going to look myself in the mirror and tell myself this to sort of remind me and encourage me to start making a change. So my first self-talk that I wrote as I was starting to make this change and transition was, you're wasting time doing stupid things and not being the man that you're meant to be. And that was the first realization that I wanted something to change, even before I actually realized it. But I knew that something just wasn't right. And then in later years, what I found is that I still wanted to change some more, especially after some difficult times came. So what I did was I wrote another quote to myself, and I said, change who you are by determining who or what you want to be. And if I do not know who or what I want to be, then how am I going to ever work towards that? So once I realized that I wasn't happy with where I was, that I wanted something better, and I needed to decide what I actually wanted to achieve in my life, then that started to change things. But unfortunately, as I was going through this period of reflection, it was during a time when things were really, really bad. I had gone to some of the lowest lows in my life, and it would lead to some even more difficult times. So one of the things that I wrote was a quote that I have next to my computer even to this day, and I look at it almost daily, sometimes twice a day, just to remind me about the dark period that I've come through and that I'm still emerging from. And what I say to myself and what I read to myself every day is, your darkest days don't define you, but instead provide an opportunity for you to display your strength and character which will ultimately drive the individual you become. And so what I had to realize is that even though some people were doing some really, really bad things to me, I could become like them or I could start drinking and drugging. And I said, those aren't things that I want to do. So what my mom always taught me is that you can either become bitter or better. I chose to become better. And because of these challenges, I'm happy to look in the mirror and say, I know who I am. I know what I believe, and as a result, I've become a better man than I ever thought I could be. But as I continue to rebuild myself, 
one of the quotes that I helped to remind me about what it is that I'm doing is this. Do it for you. Do it for you, even though others may question it. Do it for you while others don't understand it. Do it for you while others may challenge it. Do it for you, even if you don't completely believe it's possible. Do it for you, especially if your effort will also help others. Do it for you, because positive change starts with you. And that's what I had to realize is that I am in control of the things that happen in my life. But beyond that, and I'll give you just a couple more quotes as we sort of wrap this up and I start telling you a little bit about me and the show. But one of the quotes that actually one of my cousins um, helped to sort of inspire the title for, and we're going to have an opportunity to hear from her later on in the show. But one of the quotes that I wrote as I was starting to make that transition towards really starting to excel and work towards the things that I wanted and this new person that I wanted to be I wrote this quote, pursue unrestricted, sustained happiness, push, push yourself to complete a task, push yourself beyond your past, push yourself to explore many doors, push yourself to achieve even more, push yourself to get a different view, push yourself to become your best you. And then the one quote that I happen to actually take from another show, it's Grey's Anatomy, one of the shows that I, I watch often, and it's the thing that's helped me to turn everything around, is this quote, and I don't know why this was important to me, but as I was watching it, I connected with it, and I've actually memorized it and said it hundreds of times over the last year. And it's this quote from Christina Yang, who played Sandra O oh on her final episode of Grey's Anatomy, and this was the voiceover. Sometimes the future changes quickly and completely, and we're left only with a choice of what to do next. We can choose to be afraid of it, to stand there trembling, not moving, assuming the worst that can happen, or we step forward into the unknown and, and assume it will be brilliant. And that's what I've decided to do during these tough times, is to step forward and attempt to work towards being brilliant. But what I've realized also is that by sharing the challenges that I've gone through, I've actually been able to help a lot of other folks while at the same time helping myself. And as a result, I'm working and I've become, working to be, and have become a better man than I ever thought that I could be. In one of my recent interviews I had with Dr. J. Philip London, uh, he's the author of the book, Character, The Ultimate Success Factor. Dr. London's father emphasized to him this line from William Ernst Henley's poem, Invictus. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And reading this quote in his book, I understood that it stressed the importance of an individual's ownership and control over their destiny. We all have control over what we do. We might not have control over the things that happen to us, but we do have control over the things that we do in response to what others do to us. And there was another salient point in this book, which is about the measurement of achievement, which can be measured by wealth or social welfare and individual fulfillment. And when I read this in his book just a few weeks ago, it was that aha moment for me because I had spoken to one of my friends, Rachel, just a month ago. And I told her, I said, I feel like I've self-actualized. And she said to me, what does that mean for you? And I said, I don't know. Let me get back to you. And then a few weeks later, I read this in Dr. London's book. And then I said, aha, that's it. Because self-actualization isn't always tied to wealth or money or material possessions. But what I found my self-actualization to be and the thing that inspires me to get up every day and to be the best person that I can be is knowing that I can connect with individuals and share my life experiences and I do that in a lot of different ways. So by being able to help folks that are at-risk students or inmates in local jails, I realize that that's my purpose and it allows me to connect with something that's greater than myself. And I'm not saying that I didn't have that perspective before, but once we go through some difficult times that I'll tell you about in a little while, then you'll understand sort of where I'm coming from and where I'm going. But it was the realization that personal value can be either extrinsic you know, value from external sources or intrinsic value from internal sources. 
And so what I've learned to do is to find my value in myself. And I actually had a conversation just a couple of weeks ago with uh, the gentleman that's going to be on our show next week. And he said, you have to understand your worth. And that's an important quality and trait to be able to maximize your value. So if you don't know what those things are, think about those things. But I just wanted to start there and sort of share some of my perspectives on life um, and how I've got through some of the challenges that I'm going to share with you just a little bit, because it's important for you to understand my perspectives and my background, because that's going to influence the things that I'm going to bring to you on the airways over the next weeks and months, because I want to make sure that I bring things that are meaningful for you that's going to help you on your life's journey. And so let's start to fill you in a little bit about Sly. Who is he? Well, I was born in upstate New York, in Buffalo, New York, and I spent the first part of my life until about nine or ten there. And it was a great environment to live in, had a great family support system. And after um, my sister left, she relocated to go to this area, actually, um, in Virginia. Uh, my mother uh, decided to pack me up and take her take me to the south, and I ended up moving to Oxford, Mississippi, which is sort of interesting because when you're in a place like Buffalo, New York, and you've never been outside of the city, and then all of a sudden you're thrown into Oxford, Mississippi, it can be uh, quite a culture shock, especially when I got there on the first day and um, I'm out playing with, uh, getting to know my my new cousins and out playing, and then my aunt comes up behind me with this big stick, and all of a sudden I hear her banging on the ground. And I'm like, what is that? And then she goes, there was a snake that was about to bite you. So that was a real um, paradigm shift for me from what I had been used to. Um, early, early in my life, I had um, a real love for school. Um, that continued until probably about junior high. And then unfortunately, I had some bad things that happened to me in junior high. There was an instance where I was trying to get this girl that I liked to stop taking drugs. And I took the drugs from her. And then I put them away, but I, I didn't take them. I didn't want any use for them, but I didn't want her to, to use them. But, uh, the next day I came back to school and found out that somebody had told the principal that, uh, I had had some, some drugs in school. And even though I didn't have them on me anymore and didn't use them, um, I was suspended for, um, five days out of school suspension, which was pretty harsh. And unfortunately that was one of those realizations in my life when I realized that I wasn't necessarily going to be treated fairly. And unfortunately, what happened as a result is some of the kids that I was in school with, it sort of gave me that elevated status because it gave me that bad boy image. And that bad boy image um, made me feel elevated. And so I was getting some additional attention that I wasn't necessarily getting at home. So that allowed me to sort of act up. And as I acted up more, I got more attention. And so that behavior and that pattern continued as I went into high school. And then I started to do some really bad things and really stupid things like smoking drugs, not attending school. I had failed like one third of, um, excuse me, I had not attended one third of the school year during my sophomore year. I actually failed six out of seven classes. And my principal had a parent teacher conference and he said, Stacy is not doing well and we need to um, take him out of this environment. Nobody ever asked me if they could help. And there's a lot of students that are similar to me that aren't being asked how they can be helped. But fortunately, my mom was there. And my mom gave me the best advice or direction that I could have ever received because the principal said, he's never going to amount to anything. He should leave now. Not that they had done anything to help me. But then my mom said to me, Stacy, it's your life. It's your choice. You make a decision right now. And that was actually one of the best things that she could have ever done because it put the accountability and ownership on me at that young time in my life that I needed to grow up. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but by her putting it on me versus her directing me to do the things that she wanted me to do, it was the first moment in my life that I realized that I needed to grow up. And then unfortunately, it didn't change overnight and I continued to struggle. And then my senior year of high school, I didn't even know if I was going to graduate. I went to graduation, not anticipating to whether I was going to be able to graduate or not. And then I found out that I was cleared for graduation and I barely graduated high school. 
in the bottom 8% of my class. But I think that's a good point right now that we can take a break. And after these messages, we'll be right back. Fourteen fifty WOL. You wanted to see me? Yes, please have a seat. So here's the thing: when this company brought you on, we took a chance on you. You didn't have that four-year college degree we typically look for, right? But we gave you a shot anyway. And since then, you've worked incredibly hard and given it your all. Thanks. You've been an important asset to the team, but I don't think you can be an intern here anymore. <sighs> we want to hire you. You're. You're serious? Absolutely. Find your next great employee. Introduce yourself to the grads of life. Who are they? Talent worth knowing about. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. I won't let you down. I know. Don't miss out on a resource many innovative companies have already discovered. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. You don't usually get a stock tip from a 16-year-old, but I'm here to tell you about a different kind of stock. It's called Better Futures, a stock for social change that's not about making money. Instead, you invest to help students like me go to college. This is beyond a simple donation. It's the opportunity for America to invest in its kids and take an active stake in the future of the country. The return on your investment is in money. What you get back is knowing you protected our potential. So one day that potential can grow up to become surgeons and architects, executives and engineers, people who can change the future just by being a part of it. My name is Alicia and I am your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org/invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. A public service announcement brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. This is you over 30 years ago. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And this is your mom now. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Roles change without us noticing. That's why AARP gives you the information to provide even better care for your loved one. Visit aarp.org/caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. News Talk 1450 WOL AM, where information is power. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL Radio One Incorporated or their management. And welcome back to Beyond Just Talk with S. L. Young. You're listening to WOL DC 1450 AM. So before the break, I was telling you about some of the challenges that I had in high school, and I ended up graduating in the bottom eight percent of my class. And what I didn't tell you before the break is my family actually was coming to graduation, and they didn't know that I didn't know whether I was going to graduate or not. And so that was a, a very interesting experience. But、uh, I got through that moment, and then I went on. Even though I had a counselor in my senior year of high school said, "With your grades, they're atrocious." You will never get into college. You shouldn't waste your time. Isn't that lovely advice? So what happened was I decided I was going to go ahead and try to take some classes. So I went to a local university, took some classes, started to do well, and、uh, then I had a bad experience with a professor. I was trying to drive to class. It was a torrential rainstorm. One of the windshield wipers of my car fell off, and then all of a sudden there's this scraping sound on my windshield. And then I had to make a decision. Not that I knew much about cars at the time, and well, maybe I still don't know a lot. But I had to make a decision: do I scrape up my glass, or do I go try to figure out how to replace my windshield wiper, or do I speed down the highway and just hope for the best to make it to this final exam? Well, this class that I was taking, I was doing okay, but I wasn't doing all you know the best that I probably could have done. And then I get there to take this exam, and the professor said it's too late; you're not going to be able to take this exam. And I said, "Well, this is what happened." She goes, "That's not my fault." I said, "Well, I can show you the receipt, you know, and it's time dated. It's you know, it's dated today. You can see what time it was that I went in the store to get my windshield wiper." And she said, "No, tough." So I ended up fell in that class, and that was one of those moments where I got frustrated given my previous history. So I walked away, and see, that's one of the things that as educators we have to be careful of. 
we have to be careful of the messages that we communicate to students and understand that sometimes life happens and sometimes we need to make those accommodations because that one conversation that we're having with that student could be that one moment that changes everything and causes that student to walk away and never come back. So I ended up walking away from that school. Then I went to a local community college probably about six to eight months later. And then after I decided to go to this community college, um, I started taking distance learning classes, which is probably one of the worst things that I could have ever done because I didn't have good study skills. And what's interesting is I ended up failing several semesters where I even had a 0.0 average. And I know you're probably saying, well, how do you someone get a 0.0 average? Well, because I didn't try. I didn't have the skills. I didn't know. So what happened was I ended up working at a Fortune 500 company, working with some great folks that, that I still miss working with to this day. And some of them were going on to take a master's program at the American University. And what I started to realize is that I was excelling at work, but I wasn't excelling at school. And I was trying to figure out what was the difference. I'm winning all these awards at work, but I'm not doing well trying to pursue my education. But being around folks that were in my environment that were pursuing um, greater goals in education inspired me. So what I did was I went over to the American University and I said, hey, the folks that I'm working with are coming here for a master's degree program. I'm a horrible student. I haven't done well. And so I want to come here also. So what do I need to do? And fortunately, the person that um, greeted me at American University was very gracious, didn't judge me for who I'd been but provided encouragement for who I could be and what I could do. So what ended up happening was she told me to take some classes non-degree. So I ended up taking three classes non-degree, actually maybe a few more than that, to prove that I could maintain um, a 3.0 average and also to prove that I could do work at the college level. And at, that was the moment that I realized that I could actually excel and do well in college. So Giving individuals opportunities, even though they failed multiple times, is something that's important for all of us because we've all had a moment that wasn't necessarily our finest. So we can't look down on someone because they've struggled in the past. We need to be able to be willing to extend our hands out and say, hey, you're struggling now. If you're ready, I'm willing to give you a hand up because folks don't necessarily need a hand out. They just need a hand up to sort of figure things out. So after my long journey to try to sort of figure things out for school, I ended up going on to the George Washington University, and I ended up getting two more masters. But along the way, I tripped up again. I actually had a professor who was one of the toughest professors I ever had. And, you know, just to sort of give you an example, he said for the final exam, it was for a finance and investments class, he said, your final exam is going to be approximately four hours. Well, I was like, there's no way that I can have a final exam that's going to be four hours. That was the worst four-hour exam that I've ever taken in my life, and I barely got out of there alive. But unfortunately, that class was very, very difficult, but I didn't shy away from it at the beginning of the semester when he said, we're, I'm going to give you a formula that's going to start on the left side of the board, and then we're going to end up on the right side of the board. And this formula ran the whole length of the classroom, and, but at the beginning of the semester, I was like, there's no way a formula could be that long. But I didn't shy away from the challenge, and I didn't do well, but I got through it. And then I had to do some soul searching yet again. And I had to write a letter after I got suspended from the George Washington University. I had to write a letter to get back in. Imagine it with my long academic challenges, all my history of academic challenges, and now I've spent all this time, and now I'm being put out on the street again. You know, would I ever finish my degree? But then that's when I said, you've got to step up. You've worked too hard. It's about character. It's about digging in. It's about perseverance. It's about resilience. If you get knocked down, you got to get up. You know, there's that old expression, if you get knocked down six times, get up seven. So that's what I continue to push through. So I ended up graduating. Then I went on and I graduated again. So I ended up getting two masters from the George Washington University. And then on the professional side, I'm not one to shy away from challenges. I've had an extensive experience working and building operations, network security in a lot of different areas, which has made me who I am today. And the reason that I've been able to learn and master so many different things is because I'm willing to take a chance. Just because you don't have the skill set or the experience doesn't mean that you shouldn't take a chance. Because if someone gives you an opportunity, go ahead and try it. And if you fail or you don't do as well as you want, well, okay. One of the things I always like to say is that there's always value in the journey, even if the outcome isn't as expected. So that's sort of the mentality that I had. 
So I worked in telecom for many, many years and uh, ended up separating from a company because they, it was after a merger and they were given a nice package to separate. So I decided to try something different. And then I went into consulting, started doing some network security and some other things. But what I found is when you're not working as an employee, there can be different challenges. So what I started experiencing as a consultant is some things that I thought were unethical or very questionable behavior and workplace bullying. And so just to sort of cut through this, but I work for a company that uh, I work for a senior vice president that was very abusive, called me names every day, told me I was stupid, said a lot of other things. And then at that point, it was just at the moment that I said that, I, you know, life is too short for somebody to um, go through, through these, these type of things every day. And so I ended up leaving that organization and became very, very depressed. And for a long period of time, I didn't want to do anything. And I went to my doctor and I said, look, I'm starting to d- get depressed. Can you give me something to take the edge off just in case I need it? Well, I never took it, but I wanted it there just in case I did. And as I started to process all these things that were going on that were very dark for me and wondering why it was so difficult to try to be a good person and then bad things happen, what I did was I started to write. And so I started writing my inspirational series called It's a Crazy World, Learn From It. And basically I was writing some quotes to sort of give me some direction in terms of the things I was thinking as I was trying to process these things. And so I wrote that first book. And then after I wrote the first book, a buddy of mine said, you know what, if you write a few more quotes, we can create a series and we can put it into an application. I said, oh, well, let me think about that. And then I started writing. And then as I started writing more, I found that it was something that made me feel good. It was a way for me to process all of those bad feelings that, that were inside of me. And it allowed me to release a lot of the stress that I was feeling. So I ended up writing uh, at about probably about two books in the series um, in 2012, uh, maybe a third one. And then as I was learning to try to get stronger, I was in a classroom with my students. And one of the things that I like to do is have conversations about vulnerability, because a lot of times individuals think that vulnerability is a bad thing. Well, vulnerability is not necessarily a bad thing. Vulnerability is actually a way that we can connect with, with each other on a different level. Because a lot of us have shared experiences. So in my classroom, I try to make sure that we share information about ourselves because we're spending 16 weeks together. So we should know something about the individuals that are in there. And I make sure that I call on all of my students by name. But what I started to do one day, and I didn't plan to do it, I shared my academic journey and how difficult it, it had been. And then surprisingly, after that, students came up to me and said, you know what? I've had similar issues. And then I realized that it wasn't that big of a deal. And then what I started incorporating in my class is a vulnerability exercise where students would share their vulnerabilities. And then it allowed us to connect in a lot deeper ways and be more connected than we ever could have in in, in the first place. So being vulnerable about the challenges that you have aren't necessarily a bad thing. So after I had some challenges with vulnerability, well, after I shared some of my vulnerabilities and my difficulties with etching, I had a student come up to me and he told me that he was going to jail. He said, I'm probably not going to be back tomorrow, but um, I want to know if there's a way that I can finish the course once I get out. And I told him, I said, when you get out, you contact me. And if it's within two semesters of this class, I'll make sure that you get, get through this course. Well, interestingly enough, I had another student in another section came up to me one night after class and he started crying. And, you know, it was just like a sudden event. It was this big burly guy and not that it matters that he was big and burly because we all cry. And when he started to cry, I realized that it was something significant. So I spent about three hours with the student after class and he told me everything that he was going through. And then that moment made me realize that my responsibility as an educator was beyond providing the lessons in the classroom. And then those two moments would would end up changing the trajectory of my life. Because after I dealt with the first student, because he said that that inspired him and other students told me that that my experience inspired, inspired them, what I ended up doing was writing my book, Above Expectations, My Story, An Unlikely Journey from Almost Failing High School to Becoming a College Professor so that I could share with others my experiences to hopefully inspire them to become better. And when that gentleman, the first one that I was telling you about in the, that was in my class, got out of 
jail, he contacted me and said, Sly, I want to take you up on your offer. And I was happy that he contacted me because I wish somebody was there for me when I was having my challenges. And then for about a five-week period, I actually taught a class just for him. And it was probably one of the most rewarding things that I had ever done. And my two experiences with these gentlemen would play a big factor in a decision that I was going to make just a couple months later because I had started a nonprofit called Saving Our Communities at Risk through Educational Services, which is called Socrates. And through Socrates, I go into local jail, a local jail, and I teach inmates about life, business, and soft skills. But before I made that decision, some of my friends and family said, you should take your inspirational quotes into the jail. I'm like, into the jail? I don't know if I want to go into the jail. But then I thought about it a little bit and I explored the options, contacted a local jail. They invited me in. And so I went in to talk to them about volunteering at the jail. And then what happened was, surprisingly, they asked me if I wanted to go see a housing unit that day. And I was like, oh, well, I hadn't planned on it. And I wasn't mentally prepared, but I said, okay, why don't we go see one? So we get down there and I look inside and then I was like, oh, okay. Okay. Thanks for showing me. And then all of a sudden the badge was swiped and then we go in between doors and then swiped again. And then now I'm all of a sudden I'm inside this unit. And let me tell you something. If if you've seen locked up, you know, it's different seeing locked up on TV versus actually being in a housing unit when you're seeing these folks with these uniforms on, because it, it, it feels different. It's closed in. But let me tell you what happened. I took a couple of steps, and then all of a sudden I heard Stacy. And I was like, hold on. Nobody in here knows me. So I ignored it. And then I heard Stacy. And then all of a sudden I turned and I look, and there was a gentleman standing up, and he said, hey, it's such and such from such and such. So it was somebody I hadn't seen in almost 20 years, 20 to 25 years that I ran with in high school that was in that jail. And then after that experience, I went to Facebook and shared the experience with my family and friends and said, should I take this as a sign that I should be in the jail? And at that point, I took that as a sign that the jail environment was somewhere I needed to be. And after the break, we'll continue on with the story and a little more. We'll be right back. 1450 WOL, Washington, D.C., and WPRS HD2, Waldorf, Washington, a Radio 1 station, and worldwide at WOLDCnews.com. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Confessions of a Potentially Perfect Parent. Brought to you by adoptuskids.org. Okay, here goes. I know more about cooking dinner for a party of 12 than I do about packing a lunch for a 12-year-old. I know kids like things like PB&J, pigs in a blanket. Oh, and fish sticks. They do love fish sticks. Filets I get, but sticks? What part of the fish does the stick come from? I know I can read a cookbook that'll tell me how to make a red wine reduction, but where are the cookbooks that can teach me how to cut the crusts off bologna sandwiches? Oh, maybe we can compromise on mac and cheese. Can you make that with brie? Everybody likes brie, right? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to push your food around their plate. Call 1-888-200-4005 or visit adoptuskids.org for more information. This message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt Us Kids, and the Ad Council. I want to thank my mommy for loving me so much, for taking me out to the park, for reading me books, for taking Taking me to the doctor when I broke my foot in ballet rehearsal, for leaving me alone when I wanted to be alone. And And now, now, as a grown-up, I'm thankful for being able to take care of you, my dear mom, for having the chance to take you to the park, for reading you those books we enjoy so much, for being able to take you to your therapies after you twisted your ankle. For understanding that sometimes you simply want to be alone. Roles change without us noticing. And in your new role, we help you help. 
Visit aarp.org caregiving to get practical health and wellness tips to provide even better care for your loved one. Remember, visit aarp.org caregiving. AARP, we help you help. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL, Radio 1 Incorporated, or their management. Welcome back to Beyond Just Talk with your host, S.L. Young. All right, folks, welcome back. Let's see, we got my joiner music in now. We can rock out a little bit as we continue on with our story. Thank you for listening to the debut of Beyond Just Talk with S.L. Young. So before the break, I was telling you about uh, I was in the jail environment, and then someone that I had run with about 50, you know, 20 to 25 years earlier saw me, and I took that as a sign that that was where I was supposed to be. So, you know, sometimes life has a funny way of... Um, providing us with direction when we least expect it. So continuing on with some, some other things, just to sort of move the story along a little bit. Um, one of the things that, um, happened to, well, actually I'll tell you this first. So one of the things that was probably one of my best joys in life is being able to be a caregiver for my mom. It can be one of the most challenges, challenging things to do, but I've been taking care of my mom for about 15 years. Um, you know, there's moments of highs and lows, and I'm sure some of you out there have the same responsibility, but understand even when you're having those difficult moments, um, it can be some of the best gifts in life to know that you're there for a parent to support them in the years that, that they need to be supported as they supported us um, throughout our life. But now I'm going to sort of turn a little bit to a little bit darker subject because by deciding to be ethical and leaving a couple of jobs because folks were unethical and I refused to be unethical and dealing with workplace bullying, it led to some tough times for me that really questioned who I was, what I was doing, what value I had. So now the conversation becomes a little darker. So in March of 2014, last year, I was one phone call away from committing suicide. I almost took my life. And The interesting thing is that I didn't even anticipate that it was going to happen. I had been under all of the stress um, related to um, the things that have happened to me, folks doing bad things, trying to be a good person, and then other bad things happening to me. And just folks just, just being really, really nasty people and vindictive people and And then the pressure of taking care of a mother, the daily responsibilities of that. And then all of a sudden, I just imploded. So what happened on that day back in March is I woke up. My eyes were open, but I wasn't awake. There was a real cloud in the room. It was really dark. It was really heavy. I barely sat up in my bed. And as I sat up in my bed, I stared ahead at the TV. Couldn't concentrate on anything. And then in a matter of time, within an hour hour and a half, things started to suddenly change rapidly and I became very emotional. And the tears started to roll down my face and I had started to give up on life because I was depressed, I was defeated, I was in despair, I was in denial, I didn't want to go on. But I knew that I needed to move forward for my mom because I'm her primary caregiver. But I didn't want to live anymore. I had given up on life. So I called my brother, Johnny. And when I called him, I said, trying to be strong, I just want you to be there and take care of Ma if for whatever reason. I can't do it. And then I broke down, even though I didn't want to. And my brother started to ask questions, and I hung up the phone. And then my brother kept calling back and kept calling back, and kept calling back, and kept calling back, and I refused to pick up the phone because I was ready to end my life. I just wanted to know that he would take care of my mom. So I finally picked up the phone, and my brother said to me, Stacy, this is just a moment. Get past this moment. And then at the same time, in a little flip manner, he said to me, Use the advice in your own books. 
And, you know, there was something in that that was sort of flip, but funny at the same time, that it's like you're writing all these inspirational quotes, but you, you're not using them for yourself. So it took a little bit of time, but slowly but surely, I got stronger. And then an hour passed, and I started to feel a little stronger. Two hours passed, I got a little stronger. And then the incredible thing, and the best thing that I could have ever have done was four to five hours after I was moments from taking my life. I got up and I went to the jail to teach. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do, but it was probably the most important thing that I've ever had to do because by getting up and continuing to move on with life, it allowed me to begin that process of healing. And then the next day I was to do a speaking engagement. I didn't want to do that, but folks had paid to hear me speak. So I got up and I went and I did it anyway. But what's sort of interesting about the story and what I haven't told you is a month prior, I got a phone call out of the blue from a local library that asked me to come and speak. And they said, what they said, we have a healthy living series. We want you to come speak. And I said, well, what do you want me to speak about? She goes, what, you know, what topic do you want to speak about? And I said, I don't know. And then out of the blue, I said belief. And I didn't know why I said that I had never spoken or written about it before. But for some reason, I put that out there. So one week and one day after I almost took my life, I went to a local library to get the biggest, best, and most important presentation of my life. I stood in front of a crowd telling them about the power of belief. But the reason that that presentation was so powerful was because I was trying to convince myself to believe in life again. And so I continued to move forward. And then a couple of weeks later, about four weeks later, after I had almost took, taken my life, almost took my life, I wrote a book. And I told my sister, I called her, and I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book. I said, there's this guy that, and there's a great book um, by Viktor Frankl um, it's called Man's Search for Meaning, I think it is. And I read the book, and I think somewhere in there he said that he wrote the book in like 48 hours. And I'm always like a good challenge. So I said, you know what? Maybe I can do the same thing. So I told my sister, I said, well, maybe I won't do it in 48 hours. I will do it in a month. And then about two weeks later, I sent, I, I called my sister and said, hey, Joyce, I'm done. She's like, you're done? How can you be done? I said, I'm done. So over a two-week period in about 48 hours, I just allowed my heart to open up. And what was sort of interesting is I had written a book about, a, finished a book maybe a couple of weeks earlier, a month earlier, called, um, um, ethical opportunity costs. And as I was writing that book, it was the first time that I experienced something that I never experienced before. And it was that moment of flow where you're really connected to your work. And there was moments when I looked back at the book and I said, who wrote that? Because I didn't remember writing the stuff, but I remember writing it. And then a couple of weeks later, I was at my mom's house. And what happened was I was flipping through the channel, and for some reason I stopped. And I'm not a big Super Soul Sunday fan. At least I, I'm more of a fan than, than I was before. But I stopped. And then there was a man that was on there. I think it was Stephen Pressfield, the author of The Art of War. And he had talked about when folks are experiencing a certain level of growth, that they start to experience resilience. But at the end of that segment, Oprah asked him a bunch of questions. And then she said, how do you know that you're in the presence of God? And he said, I know that I'm in the presence of God when I'm in those, that moment of flow, when I look up from my work and I say, who wrote that? And it was that moment that I went, oh, I can relate to that. And I called my sister and said, I got my answer. And then in May of last year, before Maya Angelou died, I sent her a tweet. And my tweet basically said, how does someone allow the writer to fully emerge, basically? And about three weeks later, it, her, t her final tweet before she died wasn't sent to me, but I believe it gave me the answer that I needed. And her final tweet that she sent, off, sent out was loosely paraphrased. It's listen to yourself. And in those moments of quietude, you might hear the voice of God. And so that's when I was able to connect. It, it, it was a message that I took in for me because sometimes we pray, we ask for direction and guidance, but we don't always listen. And I believe that that was direction for me. So as I wrote my book, I had one of my friends, Carrie, she read my book and she said to me, don't release this book. Don't tell the story. This is a private journey. So the, I'm referring to my book that I wrote about my depression and suicide or near suicide called um, 
um, choosing to take a stand changed me, my life, and my destiny. And then so I was starting to second guess releasing that book. And then Robin Williams took his life. And then somebody on Facebook wrote, why would somebody like that just throw, the, throw away their life? And it was that moment that I said, I need to say something because somebody's making a flip comment about one of the most difficult and hardest decisions anybody can make to take their own life. How could something be that bad that someone would want to take their life? Well, I knew from personal experience, but my friends and family, beyond my sister and my brother, one of my brothers, and a couple of friends, nobody else knew. When we come back, I'll fill you you in on the rest of the story. Fourteen fifty W O L Washington D C. Fourteen fifty W O L. You're so annoying. You're so annoying. Stop copying stop me. Stop copying me. Mom, tell her to stop copying me. Mom, tell her to stop talking me. Kids will spend ten minutes copying everything their sibling says. You're such a You're doofus. You're such a doofus. How about two minutes to brush their teeth? Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. For fun two-minute videos to watch while brushing, visit 2min2x.org. Two minutes, twice a day. I have the time. Mom! Mom. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ad Council. You don't usually get a stock tip from a 16-year-old, but I'm here to tell you about a different kind of stock. It's called Better Futures, a stock for social change that's not about making money. Instead, you invest to help students like me go to college. This is beyond a simple donation. It's the opportunity for America to invest in its kids and take an active stake in the future of the country. The return on your investment isn't money. What you get back is knowing you protected our potential. So one day, that potential can grow up to become surgeons and architects, executives and engineers, people who can change the future just by being a part of it. My name is Alicia, and I'm your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. A public service announcement brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. The views and opinions of the following show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of News Talk 1450 WOL, Radio 1 Welcome back to Beyond Day. Just Talk with your host, S.L. Young. All right, folks, welcome back to WLL DC 1450 AM. You're listening to Beyond Just Talk, and I'm your host, S.L. Young, otherwise known as Sly. So I was telling you after the break, um, you know, I decided to disclose um, about my challenges. And then after I disclosed my challenges with depression and, and a near suicide, I, was, I went on a national talk show and shared my story. And that was the moment that when I released everything that I had and I held back was the moment that I started to heal. And then by releasing that story, three weeks later, I started to write on the Huffington Post. And then two months after that, I became a mentor with Dreams Catchers. And during that session, I was asked to give a commencement speak, speech. And I went to a local college to give back, to tell them about my story, my unlikely journey from a website blogger to Huffington Post in a year because I wanted to give back. And what ended up happening is earlier this year, one of the students that was in that section contacted me about interviewing someone, um, that it didn't work out. But then it led to me interviewing the executive chairman and chairman of the board of CACI. And then because I went back to thank the woman that gave me my first break on the radio, I was able to connect with someone that I would have never connected with. So by getting up and continuing to move forward, despite whatever challenges you have, and realizing that it's not a bad thing to share that you have troubles, Nobody should die because they're afraid to tell someone that they're not feeling good and they need to be better. So by getting up, that has led me to be here today because I wouldn't have been able to be here today. And I thank God that I'm still here because I'm not done yet. And through the work that I'm doing out in the community and the work that I want to do on the show, I want to help inspire and change lives. So it was a little long story to tell you, but I want it's important to fill you in in terms of my perspective. So what do we want to do on this show? Well, I'm going to give you my elevator pitch, and some of my students are probably listening, so I'm going to try to do this in less than 30 seconds as they have to do in the classroom. So this show will discuss life and business topics from a solution-oriented perspective. The goal of the show is to inspire, educate, uplift, while being positive, informative, and thought-provoking. So 
over the weeks that are coming and months, we're going to talk about life. What are things that individuals discuss, experience, and want to know more about to make their lives better? Business, who is doing what, for whom, for what reasons, to deliver products and services that meet or exceed customer expectations. Some miscellaneous topics, either from the media or from my blog on Huffington Post, We're going to do a lot of interviews every week. I look to have someone in the studio to have interviews. But the other thing that I want to do, because I believe in the the old adage, loosely paraphrases, you know, to who much is given, much is required. So I want to introduce some indie artists. So whether they're authors, singers, poets, whatever, I want to give them an opportunity to have their first break. And so there's other things that I want to tell you, but we're starting to get tight on time. But I also want to tell you is that community outreach is important. I want to be able to use this platform to extend the work that I'm already doing. So if you're out in the community and you're working with at-risk individuals and you might be interested in me coming by and doing some inspirational speaking or some of the other work that I'm doing, contact me. You can go to my website at www.slyoung.com and you can contact me. And I also have a shows page that I set up at face on Facebook. It's www.facebook.com slash beyond just talk. So go on out there and, and like that page. And before we start to wrap things up for today, I want to tell you about some of the planned guests that I have. I have an entrepreneur who launched a girls' academy, some screenwriters who recently sold a movie to Hollywood, a business growth specialist, a dean of academic administration at a community college, a program lead for M8 Development Services, and then someone who works with students in STEM. But before we go off the air today, I need to thank some of those who have helped me along the way. Because I realize that nobody does anything alone. From the day that we're born until the day that we die, somebody will help. For the food that we eat, the roads that we drive on, the seats that we sit in, somebody has helped to do that for us. So we've got to remember that somebody's always helped. So let me just say, the first and foremost, I want to thank my mom for everything that she's done for me. Because I would not be the man that I am today without her. Ms. Gwen Felder, thank you for everything that you did to help this kid, this at-risk kid, to turn around because my life is better because of you. Virginia Clay Chisholm, thank you for everything that you do to support me. And then the folks that have helped me with my book, Ivy Botang, Ken Fife, um, Lisa Fox, Dr. Sheba Holly, Beth Hoban, Gary Jackson, Nicole Lewis, Brian Mahefsky, Carrie Markles, Rokit Masood, Logan Rice, Jennifer Johnson, Goya Wallace, Ed Yeldell, And Maggie Litton for giving me my first break on radio. Allison Seymour, my first break on TV. Beth Jannery, allowing me to come in and speak to your students. Pat Thornton for all the guidance that you've given me. My students and the countless others that have helped. And then my new Radio One family for allowing me to have this incredible opportunity. And my sister, Joyce, and my brother, Johnny, for saving my life. And real quick before we go, let me get someone else that I want to thank. Because without having this person, my cousin, Virginia Smith, None of this journey would have been possible because in September of 2012, we hadn't spoken for a while and she came on and she said, told me, you should get on the radio. And because she planted that seed in my head, I made a phone call that changed the trajectory of my life and led me to this moment. So Virginia Smith, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi, cuz. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. I just wanted to have you on my first show and publicly thank you for letting me know that I was capable of doing something more. Why do you think it's important to share that type of information to, with folks? I think it's important uh, simply because when you see a uh, potential in a person, a determination, and I think you should share that with the person because, first of all, um, life and death is in the power of the tongue, and that's from Proverbs 18 and 21a. And all I did was just speak what was on my mind, what came to me, and I just forced my opinion to you, and you did the rest. Well, you know, but it was very important that you planted that seed, because sometimes individuals see things that others don't see. And and that's very, very important to be able to point that out. So I will forever be grateful for you uh, letting me know. And uh, But thank you for being on. And before I go, it looks like we have one more caller. I don't know if we can get the other caller on the line real quick. Can we switch, switch over? We might have another caller. Do we have another caller there? Thank you for calling. Go ahead. Hi, it's Kimberly Allen from High Rise. Hi, Kimberly. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. We probably got about 30 seconds here, and then I'll have to wrap up the show. Okay. Your comment? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was calling in for the next uh, call, <laughs> for the next uh, show. Okay, well, we'll let you go then. Okay. All right, so... Uh, Folks, um, as we start to wrap up today's show, I hope that you enjoyed today's show. I really wanted to give you a little bit about my gr- background and some of the things that we're going to be doing. On next week's show, my guest will be Rashawn McDonald, who is an entertainment powerhouse, a Hollywood writing veteran, a philanthropist, a man who clearly cares about others, and the architect who negotiated the deals behind the Steve Harvey global media brand. Remember, your candle is fuel from within. So don't let anyone reduce or block the fuel to maximize its brightness. Enjoy the rest of your week. Until next time, my friends, have a good one, and we'll fill you out with my music. Thanks, folks, for joining the debut of Beyond Just Talk with S.L. Young. Have a good one. W-O-L.